ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you Professor Philippe Zimbardo. Uh, he is an emeritus professor at Stanford University, and uh, he's still teaching and lecturing uh, worldwide. Professor Zimbardo uh, first time came to us uh, two years ago in uh, 2012. Uh, last year has a lecture in this room. Yesterday, uh, in Nikishovets has been open Zimbardo Center with a show by our TV. As a dean, I would like to express my hot thanks to Professor Zimbardo for his uh, fruitful cooperation with our faculty, Faculty of Education and Psychology of the University of Silesia in Katowice, and for lectures these lectures will, uh, will take Mr. Professor to our students, our academic teachers, and uh, teachers from different uh, type of schools in our region. Mr. Professor, I'm very happy to see you again, Katowice. Have a nice day. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I am delighted to be back again. Uh, I'm glad that you invited me. Um, I have some old ideas and some new ideas, uh, but the most exciting thing I could say is that yesterday uh, the most amazing, wonderful experience in my life happened in Niki Shovitz. Uh, with the help of Aldermajan, Agnieszka Wolchenska, Anna Anabasha, we opened Zimbardo Youth Center. And it was a beautiful place. The children, our teenagers are going to learn many, many wonderful things there. And the idea came from uh, after my lecture two years ago when Anna Anabasha came to see me and said, could you come to our town? Uh, we have a problem and we work together as a team. And we created this wonderful, uh, exciting uh, educational adventure. So we hope you will all visit. We hope you will, uh, if you have some special skills, come and uh, be a teacher, be a consultant. And if you have a lot of money, we could use your sponsorship. So with that, uh, I am, ha again, really happy to be here. Um, now. So a little warm-up music to, to get us into the mood. We're going to be talking about my journey from creating evil to my new mission in life is inspiring young people to be heroic. We need a little louder. A little more. A little more. Okay. I have to get me in the mood too. So my, my focus today, the beginning part, is how do we understand the nature of evil? How do we understand why good people, ordinary people, people that you knew, know, people that I know, make bad decisions, end up doing bad things, hurting other people, harming other people, and some go to prison? This question is a question that theologians have asked, religious people, poets, dramatists, Evil is the center of uh, much um, religious debate. Why do people turn evil? We say every day in our Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil, lead us not into temptation. Um, but the interesting thing is, psychologists like me and some of you, we don't ask big questions like that. We tend to ask questions that are more precise. We call them hypotheses, and we have experiments and other ways to answer them. But the funny thing was, I was asking that question when I was a little kid. And the reason was that I grew up here in a ghetto in New York called the South Bronx, uh, where everyone was really, really poor. Most fathers didn't have jobs. Uh, and when you grow up in a ghetto anywhere in the world, there are men whose job it is to get good kids to do bad things for money, to steal, 
to take drugs, to sell drugs, to sell your body. And many of my friends who I knew were good kids did that. They gave it to the temptation because they wanted the money. If you grow up in a privileged household, you don't have to do bad things for money. You simply ask your parents and they give you an allowance or you, you do some job for it. This is our playground. This was. And if you look at it, we had to climb a big fence in order to get, get into the playground to play. And now when you look at any image, when you study art, when you study photography, you have to first look at what is in the picture, and then you have to ask yourself, what is missing that should be? Especially if you grow up in Katowice, you have wonderful something wonderful that's missing from here. What's missing is green, no trees, no flowers, no grass. So when you grow up in poverty in any inner city in the world, you grow up in the absence of nature. People need to connect to nature in order to realize their fullest potential. And in fact, if you grow up in this kind of environment, it really prepares you to be in a similar environment we call prisons, which have no nature, which is steel and concrete. The sad thing is that in America, and now in every country around the world, at least 20% of all children grow up below the poverty level. And the, and the percentage is increasing rather than decreasing. So some people say, well, it's too bad that you're poor. You know, some, uh, just work hard uh, and you will succeed. Well, there's new research in psychobiology which says that if you grow up poor, if you grow up in adverse circumstances, it affects your DNA. So it's the newest research that says nature, nurture, your experience, can change your nature. Your DNA is changed by your adverse experiences in a negative way. That means you are vulnerable to autoimmune diseases, diabetes, obesity, and many other diseases. And those diseases shorten your life. So on average, poor people live two years less than people who grew up in positive circumstances. So this is a way in which poverty actually kills life. The other impact uh, uh, that on me growing up was in school we had to read a book called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. And in this book, Dr. Jekyll, who's a nice, good man, invents a chemical that when he takes it, he is transformed into this evil Mr. Hyde. When the drug wears off, he goes back across the line between good and evil and does, is a good doctor. For me, the interesting thing was, what is that line? Because growing up as a good Catholic kid, my nun, my, the nuns told me, the priests told me, and my mother told me, that good people like us are on this side of the line and bad people like them, whoops. So th the idea that there is a line separating good and evil is comforting if you're on the good side. But, but in, in reading this and listening to that story, the, the story said maybe the line is permeable. If good Dr. Jekyll could go across and, and bad Dr. Hyde could go across, maybe any of us are not safe on the good side. Maybe we could be tempted. Maybe we could be seduced. Maybe we could be drawn across the line to do bad things. So that made me entertain, even as a child, that possibility. And I will skip this. So there are many definitions of evil. A psychological one has to focus on power. Evil is the use and abuse of power to do bad things. To use your power not for good, but to use your power for bad. To use your power to harm people through prejudice, through rumors, to hurt people through torture, through discrimination, to destroy people, to kill. But most evil is not done by individuals. Most evil is done by systems as people in Poland know all too well with the Nazi system, which was the system that created crimes against humanity. But there's evil done by corporations, fraud, corruption, the terrible economic uh, disaster we had around the world a few years ago was by men in business who were greedy, who wanted um, many uh, high profits uh, with um, uh, no security. So 
So evil is then use of power to do bad things. But when we try to understand evil, there's three levels at which we should begin our investigation. The first and the most obvious one is the evil of individuals. Individual people who do bad things. And this is what we usually think about. People who have um, a psychopathic personality, personality defects. But people are always in, embedded in a situation, in a certain family, in a certain culture, in a certain kind of school, a gang. So my analysis, and I'll present examples from my research, is we, always, we must always know what does an individual bring in to the situation, but what does the situation bring out of people? But that's not enough. The question is who creates that situation? And that's where system analysis comes in. Because systems is where the power is. It's legal, cultural, economic, historical. So when you want to change, for example, when part of our program here, my program working with uh, some people here in the audience, we want to improve the schools for, for Polish children. We want Polish children to love school, the teachers to love school, parents to love school. But in order to do that, we have to begin to change the system of education. And that's a more difficult thing than to ch make the classroom more exciting, but we will do. <clears throat> So why do ordinary people turn evil? <clears throat> Here on, the, on the, your, your left is a recipe. <clears throat> Each of these words is part of a lot of research that shows that the majority of people when put in a situation where that principle dominates, <clears throat> good people can be led to do bad things. So for, just for so example, dehumanization means I begin to think about you as less than human. Like, really like an animal. Uh, diffusion of responsibility, it means when I'm in a group, I feel I, I'm no longer responsible for what bad things that happen. It's shared. My, my responsibility is now diffuse. Sometimes authority is good, but often we are blindly obedient to authority, which tells us to do bad things. And I'm going to give examples of all of those in a minute. Let's quickly look at systemic evil. I learned recently that China, which is now one of the most powerful countries in the world, it's really a paradox. It's the most communist and the most capitalist nation in the world at the same time. Every year, the Chinese government kills one million Chinese men. Last year, this year, next year, and forever. How could that be? The Chinese government encourages Chinese men to smoke. And in fact, 320 million Chinese men smoke two or three packs of cigarettes a day. And we know from all cancer statistics that of those 320 million, one million will die of, of uh, smoke, re uh, tobacco-related disease, cancer usually. Why did they do it? They make enormous profit because the Chinese government controls the cigarette monopoly. They make more than 600 billion yen every year. The interesting thing is only 2% of Chinese women smoke because the, the propaganda is that it's masculine to smoke. So the difference between 2% women and 54% men is the biggest gender gap in the world. More Chinese men smoke than any other country, fewer Chinese women smoke. But what do they do with their money? They do wonderful things. They create schools. And I found this picture of this school. It's in a province called Sichuan. We will re we'll visit later in my talk about a little Chinese boy who was a hero in that province. And this is called the Sichuan Primary Tobacco School. Tobacco is in the name of the school. And what's interesting is, um, on this sign, it says, ingenuity is the fruit of diligence, but tobacco will help you succeed. That's horrible. Every child going into the school is a sign that says, you should smoke if you want to succeed. And of course, Chinese children want to succeed as children everywhere do. The other thing is because, th so the other part of the system is they control the media. So they prevent anti-smoking campaigns. So this is systemic evil at its worst. War is systemic evil, genocide, slave labor, sex trafficking. These are evils of action. These are people doing bad things to other people. There's another kind of evil, it's called the evil of inaction. 
the fact that no government in the world is doing anything to stop the, the ravages of climate change is a disaster. Our world, the, the ecology of a world, of every nation is changing. Some f really, really bad, and some it's even changing for the better. No government has an active program, maybe before 2020, 2050, they say. It's too late. Because big business in every country says, we don't want we, we to we don't wanna spend the money to have um, um, uh, special um, uh, carbon d diffusers on our, on our um, smokestacks. So because of the, their greed, they are changing the environment for young people in really terrible ways. I should mention in passing that sex trafficking is now the most profitable business in the world. Sex trafficking is the most profitable business in the world. It's more profitable than drug trafficking. And the UN estimates that there are more than 650,000 women and children who are sex slaves. The people who own them uh, give them, uh, it takes only $2,000 a year to feed them and keep them in some room. And each one of the sex slaves makes $30,000 profit. If you say 650,000 times 30,000 profit a year per one, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So many of the men who used to do tr drug trafficking are switching to do sex trafficking. When I was in high school in that South Bronx, one of my friends was a little Jewish kid named Stanley Milgram. And Stanley was concerned. It was a long time ago. It was we were in the class 1948, 49. Second World War is recent. The Holocaust is recent. And he, he asked, could, could my family end up in the concentration camp? And everybody said, no, Stanley, we're Americans. We're good people. We're not like the Germans. He said, you know, I'll bet the Germans, I'll bet German kids like us said the same thing before that happened. And then he said, how do you know what you would do until you're in the situation? When you're not in a situation looking in, everybody, we all say we're good people, but you know situations can make good people do bad things. So he did the first study on the psychology of evil, and he did a fascinating thing, which I'll describe very quickly. He quantified evil. Evil is this vague term. He's going to put people in a situation where their job is to deliver painful electric shock to someone else that increases in intensity from 15 volts all the way up to 450 volts. So he said evil is the percentage of people who would give 450 volts which could kill someone as part of an experiment. But we're going to take a minute to, to ask why he did this really unethical research where he has good people hurting other uh, good people. When I learn of incidents such as the massacre of Louder. men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people who are courteous and decent in everyday life can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience? Now, there are some studies in my discipline, social psychology, that seem to provide a clue to this question. The problem I want to study was a little different, went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? So that's the setup. Uh, he's going to do research <clears throat> with um, many, many men, no students. No college students, no high school students. He did the research in, in a university called Yale University, which is in the northeast part of the United States, in a small town, New Haven. He put an ad in the newspaper, what men ages 20 to 50, to help us understand human memory. And many, many people applied. When they came to the laboratory, he said, psychologists know that if you reward people for making the right answer, they learn better. Nobody knows whether if you punish people for making the wrong answer, it, they also learn better. So that's what we want to do. So then he says, uh, one of you will be a teacher, one of you will be the learner. So again, 
this is part of this, uh, the situational analysis. So teacher is a good role, student is a good role, and then there's the authority. The authority is in the white lab coat. So the authority is going to tell you what to do, and he says, the learner, your, your student, your learner will be in another room, you'll meet him first, uh, and when he makes a right answer, you say, good. When he makes a wrong answer, you press a button on the shock box. Starts with 15 volts, and each increment is 15 volts, 15, 30, 45. And you say, okay, I understand. The learner is, again, a middle-aged man, a very nice man. Uh, the teacher meets him. Says, we, we're going to work together. I'm going to help you learn. And, and he, they sh we put, he gets uh, strapped into a, his electric chair, and he goes into another room. The learner is actually a confederate. He's working with the experimenter so that he's really not being hurt. But the teacher thinks he is. And so when the study begins, the uh, learner is doing well, and then he begins to make mistakes. And you begin to shock, 15, 30, 45. When it gets to 100, he starts yelling. When it gets higher, he starts screaming. People are good people. They turn to the experiment and say, sir, I don't want to go on. He says he has a heart condition. Uh, it's really not right. Experiment says, wait a minute, you don't understand. You have a contract. You have a contract to continue this study. Please go on. And it continues this way until it gets up to 370 volts. The guy in the other room screams and there's silence, a thud, bam. How could you be helping him prove his memory if he's unconscious or dead? Not very well. So at that point, everybody should quit. And the curious thing is if you're pressing those buttons, you get up to 370 volts, no one quits. Everyone goes all the way to the end if you got that far. So this is, a, a, the, Milgram tested 500 people in New Haven and then 500 more in another small town, and he included a group of women. So he did 16 different experiments, each one with 50 to 100 people. And in each experiment, he varied one aspect of the social situation. And I just want to show you uh, a few of those uh, studies. I want to highlight. So in general, so, so this, is, this is the percentage of people who give 450 volts and the majority, 60% 60, uh, 60, uh, in one, two, three, four, five studies. Study 13 is women, no different than men. So women are as likely as men to blindly obey this authority. And what does the authority tell you to do? He's telling you to do something that goes against your conscience. We are all, we are all, we are all raised as, as good citizens, as good kids, as good Catholics, not to harm someone. But again, all evil is evil of semantics. The, the experiment is not saying we want you to harm him. He's saying we want you to help him. You're going to help him by harming him. But the two most interesting things of all, the, all this research is study 19, uh, study, I'm sorry, 16 and 5. In study 16, you come to the room, the experiment says, I'm sorry, we're running late. Sit down and watch. And what you see is somebody like you go all the way to 450 volts. When that happens, obedience goes from 60% to 91. Nine of 10 people go all the way to the end. On the other hand, suppose we reverse it. In study five, you come in and you see people like you refuse. Then what happens, obedience goes from 60 down to 10%. So what that means is we all are powerful social models. What we do has a positive or negative impact. When people observe our behavior, when you're doing bad things, it increases the likelihood other people will follow your example. That's called a negative ripple effect. On the other hand, when you do good things, small acts of kindness, which I'm going to talk about when we talk about my hero project, you become a positive social model. Even though you're unaware of it, people will begin to emulate what you do. So I want to switch to the experiment that I did at Stanford University way, way back in 1971 when I was a, a child. Um, uh, it's called the Stanford Prison Experiment. And essentially, the way I thought about Milgram's study was very important, but it's very rare someone says, do a bad thing. What happens is we're in a gang, we're in a group, we're in a team, and other people are doing bad things, or they're not doing, they're not doing the good things, they're not doing the right thing. 
So we live our life in institutions, in families, in schools, in businesses. So I wanted to see the power of the situation uh, when the situation was you were playing a role in, uh, in, a, in a, a setting. So in this study, we put a small ad in the paper. I wanted college students. I wanted bright, intelligent young men. And we put an ad in the paper. Our study was going to go two weeks. And 75 young men answered the ad. And we gave them personality tests, clinical interviews. And so we wanted only normal, healthy, psychologically sound, physically strong young men and smart. And then what we did is, for an experiment, we flipped a coin. You be a guard, you be a prisoner. Random assignment. Half of them are going to be co play the role of guards. Half are going to play the role of prisoners. And we don't have to tell them what it means. Everybody knows if you're a guard, your job is to have power over the prisoners. The prisoners are given smocks, numbers on, to humiliate them, to dehumanize them. They become the number. They ta we take away their name. The guards, on the other hand, have attractive military uniforms with symbols of power. And at first, the guards feel awkward playing the role, because it, it doesn't make sense. This is 1971. Many of these are anti-war activists, civil rights activists. In the 1970s, the young people around the world said, don't trust authority. But now they're in the position of authority. So they have, have them do little menial tasks, push-ups, jumping jacks. And then what happened was, on the second day, the prisoners revolted. They said, we don't want to be dehumanized, we don't want to be numbers. And they locked themselves in the cell and they started cursing the guards. And the guards at that point said, these are dangerous prisoners. Not students like me in an experiment, dangerous prisoners. We have to demonstrate to them that we have power and they have none. At that point, everything changed. They started stripping the prisoners naked, have them do degrading, humiliating things. And every day thereafter, we saw more and more sadistic, creative evil. Zimbabwe conducted a revolutionary experiment here in the bowels of Stanford University in the United States. It worked for psychology. A group of students were divided randomly into prisoners and guards and lived in a makeshift jail. The prisoners immediately became submissive. The most interesting thing is this is an experiment where we spent a lot of time uh, selecting what we thought were the best and brightest young men to be as students in this experiment. And in 36 hours, one day and a half, one of these young men have an, has an emotional breakdown, crying, screaming, uncontrollable, uh, uncontrollable. And I had to bring him to the uh, student health to be released. He then became a negative model of how you get out. Each day thereafter, another prisoner had a similar negative emotional reaction and had to be released. Initially, when a prisoner was released, we got a replacement one. But at the end of five days, at the end of six days, five of, the, five of these young men had emotional breakdowns and had to be released. And I realized I had to end the study. So the study was going to go for two weeks. I'm so glad it didn't, because I was getting crazy. Uh, but I'll tell you later the real reason, the heroine who made me stop the study. Now, if a prisoner wanted to be released, what you do, it, as in real prisons, you say, I want to go to the parole board. You write a letter why you think uh, you have been rehabilitated, why you should be released. And I had a parole board headed by an ex-convict with secretaries, people not connected to the study. But the parole board always said no. The study was, I made it very realistic. It's more like a drama than an experiment. The students who were going to be prisoners, I said, wait in the dormitory at home. And what they didn't know is I had a made arrangement with the city police, the real policemen, to come and arrest them. Handcuff them, put them in a police car, bring them to the uh, real police station, do fingerprinting, uh, photographs. I had prison chaplain come down. We had public defender. So, and then we had, of course, parents' day. Uh, uh, parents or girlfriends, boyfriends uh, came to visit. So we did everything possible to make the experience psychologically real. So on your left is a picture of prisoners who are about to go to the parole board. 
the guards put bags over their heads so they didn't know where they were because the parole board was in a different part of the psychology department. Uh, I'm not sure you can see it in this picture, but on their legs, uh, on their legs here, they had chains. On the right side of the picture is prisoners in Abu Ghraib in Iraq. Bigger, big bags, and of course, uh, bigger guns. But the interesting thing is the prison in, in Abu Ghraib that we all saw these horrible pictures of American soldiers, men and women doing terrible things to prisoners, I discovered was exactly like the Stanford Prison Study, the situation, but much worse, of course, much more intense. When those pictures were released in 2004, the lawyer for one of these young men, so all, all the, because all the prisoners and all the uh, soldiers who were prison guards put themselves in the picture, they were all guilty, obviously, doing terrible things, dragging prisoners around by the neck, by a dog leash, putting them in a naked, naked pyramid. So they all went on trial. They're all gonna be uh, given dishonorable discharge. So I defended one of these young men, Chip Frederick. I got to know him very, very well. I studied his whole background. I studied everything about that prison. And for me, he was a perfect young man had never done anything negative in his life. He won many medals and awards. He loved his country, he was patriotic, as you can see, he's always taking pictures with American flag. And he gets put in this dungeon, this, this prison, a prison of war camp, and in a very short time, he is corrupted by the situation. He does terrible things. He encourages people to do terrible things. He, he has his picture taken doing terrible things. And when I interviewed him later, I said, how could you have done these things? And his answer was, I don't know. The situation is not one thing. The situation is like uh, swimming in a swimming pool. It's, it's all around you. And he said, I feel so guilty. I'm so ashamed. I wish I could go back and die for my country because I'm a, I'm a good person. I'm a good soldier. And then after, afterwards, I interviewed him and his, his wife, and he's a man who, who lives in a small uh, town which is very prejudiced. And he married an African-American woman with two, with two older children. And his wife said, and his children say, he's a wonderful husband, wonderful father. So again, here is this thing. Here's a, a wonderful guy before, a wonderful guy after. And you put him in this situation that he gets corrupted uh, and uh, he does terrible things. The main point of what I'm saying is captured in this cartoon. These are two policemen who are off duty. And one says to the other, I'm neither a good cop nor a bad cop, Jerome. Like yourself, I'm a complex amalgam. Amalgam is a mix of positive and negative personality traits that emerge or not, depending on the circumstances. So it says we all have within us goodness and badness, psychological templates to do anything that any human being has ever done. We can follow the lead of bad people and do bad things. We can follow the lead of good people and do good things. It all depends on the circumstances around us and the circumstances we grew up in. I'm gonna skip this now for a minute. So I wrote a book, some of you know, called The, the Looser Effect, and although so I never wrote a book after the prison study. I wrote, I, did, I wrote many psychological articles, but then I switched to do research on, on shyness, research on time perspective. But after I got involved in Abu Ghraib, people said, hey, you gotta go back and revisit your experiment. You know, what really happened there? And how are you gonna draw the parallel between Abu Ghraib and, and the Stanford Prison Experiment? And so 15 of those 16 chapters are really grim. It's really about evil, not only in the research, but in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in, in, uh, in uh, Auschwitz. And it was terrible for me to write. It took two years and it was painful every day to bring myself to write this. But when I got to the last chapter, I said, you know, I need and the reader needs relief. Meaning we need to understand that in all of these horrible situations, they're always a minority who resist 10%, 20%, 30%, who do not give in, who do not obey blindly. So in the Milgram study, even where you see somebody go all the way and 90% go all the way, there's still 10% said no. 
it's true in, in, in uh, the Holocaust, in every country in the world where the, where the Nazis occupied, where they, where, they had, um, where they brought Jews to concentration camps, there was always people who resisted, uh, even at the, at the risk of their life. And we'll talk, we'll talk about some Polish heroes in a minute. So really, in writing the book, I, I began to think about, you know, the book is a celebration of the human mind's infinite capacity to make any of us kind and some cruel, make some of us caring for others and others indifferent, make some of us really creative, do wonderful things, and other people destructive. And it pushes some people to be villains, to do terrible things that we all know, we've all seen. And on the other hand, it encourages us, inspires us, that same human mind to be heroes. And that's obviously where we're gonna go next. So are there circumstances that can make ordinary people do good things? Some people believe that we are born with a, a gene for goodness or a gene for evil, like, like this. I don't believe that. I believe people are born um, um, with a potential, with, with a templates in your mind to do anything that is imaginable. And it's nature. It's your nature is shaped by your nurture to do uh, the right thing if you're in the right circumstance. So I have given up studying evil. I understand enough of it. I've written about it. And so now the rest of my life is going to be focused on getting ordinary people to do heroic deeds. So the curious thing when I was writing that last chapter is I did a literature search. And the answer is we do not know what makes ordinary people do heroic deeds because there's no research on heroism. How could that be? Then I realized the word hero and heroism is not in any psychology book, including my own. Embarrassment. It's not in the positive psychology movement because compassion is, empathy is, they are private virtues. Hero heroism is a civic action. It's a civic virtue. Okay. So I want to encourage you, students, graduate students, to begin to do uh, research on heroism. So what is a hero? Our children have superheroes, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, uh, and they are wonderful fictional fantasies about imagining your, your favorite superhero. Usually they're always fighting evil. But we say no, they are the wrong hero for you. Why? Because they are fantasies. They have abilities you could never have. They can fly, they could climb walls, bullets bounce off of them. And you have something they can't have. You have a brain. That brain gives you a mind. That brain and mind enable you to do almost anything that is humanly possible. And in fact, every superhero is the creation of a cartoonist. So superheroes have no brains. They have attributes that some human has given them uh, in uh, the crea creative mind of the cartoonist. So heroes are people who act on behalf of others in need, or they defend a moral cause. They do it aware of the risk to their life in the extreme, or there's some personal cause. If you're a whistleblower against fraud corruption, you often lose your job or you don't get promoted. The interesting thing is heroes are usually modest and humble. Almost always, when you say, that was heroic, people say, no, no, I did what I had to do. It's not, it's not heroic at all. Again, the interesting thing, heroism is a social attribution. Other people have to say, what you did is heroic. You can't say, hey, I did a heroic thing. People say, uh-oh, no good, no good. So, so heroism is really, and it varies by culture. People, in, people who do something in one culture is considered heroic. The same thing in another culture might cons be considered stupid. We think at the core of heroic action is moral courage. So heroism is an act, okay? It's not thinking, it's not feeling, it's an action. And again, we want to know what are the obstacles to taking action? What can we do to facilitate it? So at, at the core, at the center of heroic action is developing moral courage. And moral courage means making decisions about what's right and what's wrong. So we need heroes for many reasons. I'm just going to mention one or two. Heroes put their best selves forward in service to humanities. They represent ideals that we all can aspire to. They are the force of good that opposes evil in its many forms. Recently, a member of my team in San Francisco interviewed Barack Obama, our president, and said, do you have to be really special? Do you have to have a gift? Do you have to have special DNA? Do you have to be unique to be a hero? 
because the old, the old view of hero, you know, was really started with uh, Greek, classical Greeks, Agamemnon, Achilles, samurai warriors. It was always male warrior killers. All the generals in every park in Poland, sitting on a horse with a gun or, or, spe or a, a sword, you know, th th those are the heroes. We say, no, that's wrong. Women are as likely to be heroes as men if it doesn't involve physical strength, if it involves psychological strength, it involves organizing networks of people to help other people, as you'll see in a moment when we talk about Irina Sendorova. But heroes are usually ordinary people who, whose actions in challenging situations are extraordinary. So when we ask Obama, you know, what does it mean to be here? Are they special people? He gave a wonderful answer. He's going to mention a woman, Rosa Parks, who he says is a perfect example of ordinary person who changed American society in a profound way. I'll show you a picture of her later, but she was just a seamstress. She, she made dresses or altered dresses for rich white women uh, in, uh, in the South. You know, uh, what's remarkable about uh, history is ordinary people are doing extraordinary things. Uh, you know, last year Rosa Parks passed away. Uh, and yeah, I, I remember sitting on this stage with world leaders and Bill Clinton and senators and governors and, and thinking uh, we were all paying homage to a seamstress uh, who had transformed the country and, and helped transform the world. Uh, you know, we, we never know sort of how our actions are going to ripple, ripple. Uh, over time. Uh, but each of us can take some responsibility for making sure that uh, we are pushing a little bit in the direction of justice and, and in the direction of equality and in the direction of tolerance. And, uh, when we do that, uh, uh, we may surprise ourselves with the amount of influence that in fact we have just by standing up or speaking up. So again, he's saying we all have a ripple effect for positive and negative. When you stand up and you speak out, he didn't add take action against injustice, when you do the right thing, when people are doing not only the wrong thing or no thing, then you can have a powerful influence on your society. So this is Rosa Parks. As I said, she was a seamstress. And one day, she gets on a bus, and every bus had a sign. Colored people sit in the back, white people sit in the front. You pay the same money. That day, she said, I refuse. She sat in the front. A white person says, get up, give me your seat. And she said, no. They put her in jail. This is a picture of her as a prisoner. Seven, uh, her number, 7053. Uh, here. 7053. Imagine you're a prisoner because you did not get up to give a white person your seat when you paid the same money. Because of her act of defiance, it's, it, it encouraged civil rights movement. Many people from the north came to the south to give support. And that action, that little action, refusing to do the wrong thing that people had done for, for years. People, black people and white people didn't even think about it. It was the rule. It changed uh, uh, de a de a segregation in the South. So all public transportation now is desegregated because of that one woman. So let's very quickly look at some heroes. Ari obviously, one of my favorites out in Poland, Irina Sendorova, ordinary woman, a social worker. She discovers that in Warsaw, not far from where she lived, the Nazis were building a ghetto, a 10-foot high brick wall that went for 100 blocks. And inside, they were going to put 400,000 Jews from not only Warsaw, but from the whole area. And she discovers from her friend who's a nurse that they're giving them a barely subsist subsistence uh, me uh, diet, 120 calories a day, a piece of bread, a potato, and, and whatever other scraps. Not enough to live on. The idea was children would die, old people would die, and whoever survived, the Nazis would then send to slave labor camps. She got her friend to give her a nursing certificate, went in to see for herself, and then she realized she, would ha she had to do something to save the children, even though they're not her children, they're Jewish, little Jewish kids. But it was not easy because Jewish parents did want to give their children to a stranger, a strange Catholic woman, so she had to persuade the rabbi to, to in turn tell these people, this is your only hope. Because again, no Jewish parent wanted to believe that their kids were going to die. So the rabbi persuaded them, and so they said yes. And she said, I promise, 
every child's name we will conceal. She actually put them in a, a jar in a bottle, hid them all over. And when the war is over, when the Holocaust is over, we will, I will do my best to reunite you. She couldn't do it alone. And what she did, and this is where women excel, she organized a social hero network of 19 other people, 18 women and one man. So it's, with her, it's 20. And what they did is every day, one or another went in, and they found an underground sewer. They could smuggle the children out. They found many very creative ways to save children's lives. In one year, they saved 2,500 Jewish children. Of course, if you were caught, they would kill you and sometimes kill your family. But now, f more than, you know, d decades later, those children have had children who have had children, and now 10,000 Jewish people around the world owe their life to this heroic, everyday hero. So that's a powerful ripple effect. The other thing, of course, is was she a hero in Poland? Not at all. When the Nazis left, the communists came in. The communists were really anti-Semitic as well. So no one mentioned it, and she didn't mention it. And it wasn't until a few years ago that in Israel, there's a foundation, Yad Vashem, which tries to discover who, who around the world, which, which Gentiles, which Christians, risk their life to save Jews. And she was identified and given the honor of being one of the righteous among the Gentiles and suddenly had hero status awarded her. Fortunately, she lives five or six years after that, and so people then came to respect what she did. And for me, this is, Illy, what, I, what I'm going to argue is, here's an everyday person, in her case, doing extraordinary deeds. Again, I just gave, I, I'm on the board of uh, advisors for the Arnkarski Institute. I gave a lecture there the other day. And what he did was equally extraordinary. Uh, when he heard about the Holocaust, he heard about Auschwitz, he got himself admitted. He, he got in, into Auschwitz prison so he could document it. He, he organized a resistance movement. And then what he did was he got out and tried to go around the world to persuade governments, especially Britain and America, to intervene in this horror. And in one way he failed because they could not believe. He actually met with the assistant of Franklin Roosevelt, the president of the United States at that time, who was my president as a child. And when Karski told him what was happening in, in the Warsaw Ghetto, in, in, in the prisons, he said, I cannot believe you. It's not clear from the records if he said any more. And either it means, I cannot believe the evil, the monstrosity you are telling me. It stretches my imagination. or. I can't believe it because if I did, I would have to tell President Roosevelt we have to, you know, uh, do something uh, uh, c constructive. And at that time, President Roosevelt said, we do not want to be involved in the Jewish question. This is the President of the United States. And so what he says is the common humanity of people, not the power of governments, is the only real protector protect of human rights. I learned also that people in power are more than able to disregard their individual conscience. That's Milgram. If they come to the conclusion that it stands in the way of what they see as their official duty. So he said the problem with governments, with systems, is people say, it's my duty to do this, even though my conscience says I should be doing the opposite. <clears throat> Again, uh, Pileski, Vittorio Pileski, also volunteered to go into Auschwitz to gather intelligence, escape. He started resistance, moving in the camp. Unfortunately, the uh, Stalinist secret police identified him as a foreign imperialist and, and killed him. But heroes come in all sizes and shapes. We're going to go back to that Sichuan province where that uh, Sichuan pri uh, primary school, tobacco school, just before the Olympics in Beijing, there was a terrible earthquake in this p place in China, and all of the school buildings collapsed because they had built, been built with corrupted construction, that is, uh, shoddy construction. And he was in a school where the ceiling collapsed and all the children were killed. He was near the door and he ran out. As he's running away, he looks back, and there's two friends struggling to get out. He runs back and saves them. People told afterwards, why did you risk your life to save, to save these kids? His answer is wonderful. He said, I was the hall monitor. It was my job to look after my classmates. So that's what I call a dutiful hero. It's putting the heroic imagination into action. Many of us were hall monitors, many of us were, but 
it's now only when there's a challenge, when there's some, some special event that occurs that we rise to the occasion. So he said, it was my job to look after my classmates. The main reason I ended the Stanford Prison Study was this Polish-American woman uh, who came down to see uh, what we were doing because halfway through, before we went to the second week, uh, I wanted um, uh, people who had no connection to the experiment graduate students, young faculty, to come down and interview the prisoners, guards, me and the staff, to, to give us an idea of you know, whether we should go to the second week. And she had been my uh, graduate student, so I was her main letter of reference, and we had just begun to date. And this is what happened. Yeah. Louder. Louder. Christina Maslach to visit the mock prison. I had heard bits and pieces uh, from Phil So the mistake I made was, I was of course the principal researcher. I was the grown up. I have two graduate students, undergraduate working with me. But I made the mistake of also taking the role of prison superintendent. As, as a researcher, I would have ended the study when the second boy broke down. As prison superintendent, my job was replace him, keep the prison going. When you are in charge of any institution, your concern is about your staff, not the people, you, uh, not the people you're there to, to service. So prison, so prison administrators care about guards more than prisoners. Hospital administrators care about doctors and nurses more than patients, and so forth. <clears throat> so I made that mistake, and in fact, what happened was I was transformed. So when I saw these horrible things happening, for me, it was a check mark on my schedule. 8 o'clock, breakfast, okay? Uh, uh, 12 o'clock, parents' day. Uh, 10 o'clock at night, toilet run, check mark. So I'm looking at what I now see as evil. I feel guilty about it when I think back, when I look at the videos. For me, it was a check mark. So it says, here's how situational power can transform any of us. Even the person doing the research to demonstrate situational power can, form, uh, can fall under that uh, impact. So essentially, the way I dealt with that uh, challenge to my authority is I married her. Uh, uh, and so again, Polish-American woman, mashlock is but a mushroom. So since then, I've given up evil, no more dining in hell, and so the rest of my life, I'm promoting goodness to make up for the bad things I did in that study. Um, so a few years ago in San Francisco, I started something called the Heroic Imagination Project, a nonprofit foundation to, to, to uh, sponsor research, to do research, to have educational programs, and, and much more. Uh, we're not, uh, we're head, headquartered in San Francisco. Essentially, it's how do we teach individuals and groups the basic awareness and skills necessary to make effective decisions in challenging situations. 
our premises, we can teach ordinary people to be capable of taking extraordinary action. Our program has been mostly in high schools and colleges and middle schools. Uh, and what I'm excited to say, and I'll say more in a minute, we are about to bring our program into high schools around Poland. So we have, we have six different lessons, all of which are understanding human nature. Each one is about an exciting aspect of social psychology, uh, li like uh, prejudice, discrimination, uh, bystander uh, uh, effect, uh, and more. And each of those uh, uh, six lessons have a standard technique of presenting. They all use videos. They, they provoke, they challenge, they excite uh, students. Uh, and so at this point, we are about to, uh, we're about to train uh, two dozen dedicated super teachers in how to use our material. I'm working with four uh, brilliant academics uh, in Silesia and in Warsaw who are going to do the training. And each of those super teachers is committed to training five high school teachers. Each of those teachers will have 20 students. So in the fall, we will have more than 1,000 students experience our program. If we can demonstrate that students not only learn the material, but they love learning, and that the teachers not only love teaching, but they love learning this kind of material, the Minister of Education in Poland, who I met with last week in Warsaw, said she will give approval to promote our program in all high schools that want it. So it would be in social studies uh, because there's no psychology program in Polish schools yet. So very quickly, our new conception of hero is we democratize. Anyone can be a hero. We want to demystify. You don't need any special attribute. You don't even have to be compassionate. You don't have to have empathy. Once you do a heroic deed, you will become more compassionate. And lastly, we want to defuse away from solo heroes to people working in networks, people working in ensembles, what we call creating hero squads. So whenever somebody tells you they have some new social program, your, an your question is, does it work? What do you mean? Can you demonstrate that what you do makes a difference on some scale that we can quantify? Does it change attitudes? Does it change perception? Does it change values? Does it change behavior? And so this is what we, we will also do, have a statistician evaluate the students, teachers, and maybe parents before our program begins and then afterwards. Uh, because if it doesn't work, we want to be able to modify it, to improve it. Because if it doesn't work, we want to know why. If it does work, we want to know how we can make it better. So the decision to act heroically is a choice that many of us will be called upon to make at some point in the future, at some point in time. So the question is, what can you do? Because we're talking about ordinary people doing extraordinary deeds, it's really how do you develop the social habits of heroism to each day, in some way, do something kind, caring, socially, uh, part of your, your social interaction. The enemy of heroism is egocentrism. When you're focused on yourself, when your main concern is, will people like me? Will people think I'm smart? Will people think I'm beautiful? Will people think whatever? You're not noticing that somebody is lonely. You're not noticing somebody is shy. You're not noticing somebody is crying. You're not noticing somebody is hurt. So you're not going to be able to be a hero because your focus is in. The other enemies of heroism are pessimism and cynicism. You believe it can't be done. It can't make a difference. It's too big to be a hero. And I'm saying, no, heroes are optimistic. Heroes are social change agents. That means every person, every child in our program leaves thinking, I could make a difference. I could make my family better. I could make my school better. I could make my friends better by doing little deeds every day. So now we know when, when there's an emergency situation, most people won't help. It's called a bystander effect. You look around, it's as if it's written on the wall, do not help. But then we also know as soon as one person breaks that rule and helps, then immediately other people help. What do you learn? Our children learn, I will be that person. That knowledge now obligates me to take action. So we have a new conception of education. Education is not to make you smart. Education is to use this kind of knowledge to make a positive change in your world. 
And we want kids, again, to form hero squads in their school to do good things, to clean up litter, to get re uh, removed graffiti, um, to clean up the parks, to clean up the rivers, to be health heroes. Children have to be responsible for the health of their family. Why? Because if you can stop one family member from smoking, if you can reduce smoking, you save a life. It's like saving a drowning person. It's, not, it's, not, it's hard to do. Cigarette smoking is addictive. We will teach you. You, you, you go on the, we'll use the power of the web. You go on with other children who agree, this is my mission, I'm gonna to try to get my father to smoke less. And we give you a program, how to do it, and you form a hero squad. Uh, and the question is, how do you, what's your goal? How do you reward your father? What are you gonna do uh, when, he, when he does that? Um, and again, you start with small steps. I mean, what's wonderful about the program is anyone can do this. We can do it in primary schools. So in a small school ne uh, near Rotswav, uh, an independent school, we have children from the first grade to high school. The principal there, Arik Agnieszka Korolnik, uh, is you making programs for his entire school based on what's available free on our website. So one program we say, make people smile. So in, in, in each class, they, they take that um, uh, mission and they do it their own way. So little children in the, in the primary school, they make masks that are funny. In the next level, they make jokes, cartoons. Uh, in the next level, they do other things. And then at the end of the week, all the school gets together and children in each class, primary school, secondary school, um, middle school, they share with the other children what they did to make people smile. And if everybody around you smiles, you make th your world a more happy place. So we want to change the perspective. Me becomes we, I become us. We want to break through that, that egocentrism and say, no, your job in life is to make things better for others. And if the same time people think the same, they're gonna make it for you. So the reason I help people who are in need is not that I'm a good person. I could be there. I could be lying down. I could have tripped and fall. I could be hurt. And I would like you to help me. See, the problem with compassion and empathy is they are private virtues. So when I'm bleeding, I don't want you to come over and say, I feel your suffering. I understand your suffering. I'm compassion. I say, pick me up. Don't let me bleed to death. Pick me up. Unless you do heroic action, go away because you're blocking somebody else from helping. So th at one of the, those Nazi rallies that you saw in that little picture, everybody is saying, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. This guy refused. He said, shit, no, I won't raise my hand. So we want to say, be that guy. But usually the problem is not evil of action. The big problem in our life is indifference. People don't care. We all have suffered from bullies. Either we were bullied or we knew somebody was bullied and we know we did nothing. We could have taken some action. At the very least, we could have told the child who was being bullied, I'm sorry. Or we could have told the teacher or we could have told the bully, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. So we want to create a heroic vision in which silence, apathy, indifference is never an option. It's not, you don't even say, I could do this or that. You only say, what can I do to make the world better? So, I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, what I'm talking to you about is what I think is the basics of human life. How do, how do we make life better for each other in every nation, in every city, in every town? Uh, and so these are concepts that I now begin to live with. It becomes automatic. So I'm hoping that you will jo visit our website the world needs many more heroes. As Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. Heroes take action. Why is action effective action? Because heroism is the hope of a future where humanity rules as evil is diminished. And again, evil comes in many disguises, many forms, from things you hardly notice, uh, like corruption, like fraud, like deception, to the outright evil that uh, Polish people uh, experienced for 40 years. So the question is, what will you do? And again, we're saying, it's an obligation, we're saying kids, boys, girls, men, women, there's no gender difference in heroism now. We want everybody, when they open their shirt, to have that super, superman, superwoman uh, undershirt. So I'm here to say, let's work together. 
we, we're creating uh, heroic imagination teams in, in high school. We certainly got, we're doing it in uh, the Zambara Youth Center in Nikishovitz. Uh, we need your support, we need your help. Uh, we need donations, we need money. Uh, you go on our website. In addition to learning all these wonderful things, uh, you can contribute, there's a place to donate, and we would love it. I'm available for pictures, for selfies, for hugs, uh, for, for signing books. Thank you so much.